the power point up there. Okay, yeah, I've been live for a few seconds. Do you see anything? Oh, I see you. You see me? Do you see me in my PowerPoint or just? I see your PowerPoint, yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Um, let me get off the phone just a sec. All right. Okay, everybody on the Sayville Library Facebook page. Uh, we're just about to begin. We'll be uh, be sharing this shortly. We're just wrapping up our, uh, our technical issues on our end. Uh, excellent. So I, I see you can hear me, um, and I know our our friend Peter from Save the Library is watching us right now. So if we could share this on the uh, event page, that would be good. Um, and we will get going. All right, so uh, we can get uh, we can get started here um, in just a moment here. Uh, Peter, are we on the uh, are we on the the event page? Okay. All right, so uh, we can get going here. Uh, let trust Peter and uh, take care of these issues, get us shared on all the appropriate pages. Uh, my name is Chris Clunan. Uh, this is a presentation Cuba 2020 uh, and where we go uh, from here. So a little bit about uh, who I am. Uh, my name is, again, Chris Clunan. I'm the program manager at a company called Cuba Fame, which stands for Food, Art, and Music Explorations. Uh, I'm the program director over there. Uh, back when travel was up and running, uh, I was um, running travel. Uh, I see everybody can hear me now. So I also see some comments. Um, feel free uh, to, if you, as we go along, if people have questions, um, uh, just shout it right out in the uh, the comments section. I'll be back and forth between my uh, my PowerPoint and the Facebook page, so we can uh, we can get all your questions answered. Um, so I was a program. I am the program manager for a company called Cuba Fame. Um, and what we do is we run trips exclusively to Cuba. Uh, we've been working in Cuba for about eight years or so. Currently travel to Cuba is suspended uh, due to the coronavirus outbreak. Um, I have a, um, a bachelor's degree in political science from Stony Brook University. That's when I first went to Cuba in January of 2012. Um, I later went to grad school at Burlington College in Vermont. I studied abroad at the University of Havana. I have a few certificates in uh, Cuban studies from the Jose Marti Institute. Uh, and since then, I've been working exclusively on, on Cuba-related issues, traveling down there, speaking around the US about uh, Cuba-related issues, trying to uh, introduce the people of Cuba and the people of the United States uh, to each other after 60 years of, uh, of separation and uh, intense relations. Uh, I'm not Cuban or Cuban-American. That's a question I get a lot. Uh, and I work only and exclusively uh, in Cuba. Uh, so we'll start off uh, with what's going on with the uh, the coronavirus. Um, the Cuban government has been able to keep a relatively um, steady figure, a low outbreak on the island, just about 1,700 cases in a country of almost 12 million people. So they've been able to keep the infection rate relatively low. Almost 1,000 people have recovered. Uh, less than 100 people have died there. 69 people have died. That was the new number as of this morning. Um, they've been able to contain this because they've been going around the country uh, house by house, um, millions of home visits, um, constantly checking on the population um, with temperature checks and asking about symptoms and if anyone's not feeling well and contact tracing and all of that. And they've been using that information to keep people in isolation if need be and to get people in the hospital and to get people the treatment they've needed. Uh, unfortunately, what they've seen is um, donations of medical supplies to Cuba have been blocked. Uh, American sanctions prohibited a shipping company from bringing uh, medical supplies from China uh, to Cuba. So donations of test kits, masks, respirators, those types of things 
unfortunately we're not able to reach the island they're working on uh, working around that but cuba has produced its own medicine to treat uh, coronavirus um it's their own version of interferon um but uh, the american our people all the american people are not able to obtain this medicine because of uh, sanctions from the u.s government uh, prohibiting imports uh, from cuba uh, but that medicine is being exported around the world uh, I'll have a graph for you on our next slide to show uh, where Cuban um, medical professions are treating coronavirus all around the world, more than 20 countries. Uh, this is one of the ways that Cuba funds its government was uh, they have more doctors, they've trained more doctors per capita than any other country. And they uh, export these medical services around the world. Um, so they, they'll ex they'll send their, their doctors to, um, to other countries uh, and they will charge tens of thousands of dollars for these services per doctor and the doctors will see a portion of that usually about a third um, but the americans american government has called these uh this is a modern day slavery but if you talk to cuban doctors they would not characterize it that way um, they actually earn more money when they're working abroad than they do when they're at home uh, it doesn't compare to the salaries that american doctors are making um, but most Cuban doctors see it as a, a point of national pride and a privilege to be able to, uh, to serve abroad. Uh, Cuba right now is closed to all foreign tourists. Um, they had to uh, evacuate uh, tourists to Canada, the United States, and all over the world uh, when the outbreak happened and they suspended all flights into the country to try to limit the spread of the virus. The virus, they believe, was brought to the country uh, by a few tourists from Italy and spread from there. Um, and the, the food shortages that are occurring in Cuba because of not only the sanctions, but the lack of dollars coming in from the tourists have created long lines, um, which of course we know is uh, a catalyst in, in seeing more infection spread. Uh, so the police have done their best to try to keep people six feet apart when they're waiting in these lines for food and, and other necessities. Um, some neighborhoods have seen the water turned on every other day uh, just because of shortages um, in the energy supply, sanctions against Venezuela. Um, and Venezuela, obviously in the middle of a civil war right now, is one of Cuba's largest oil suppliers. Uh, so the, the lack of uh, consistent oil supplies from Venezuela has, has affected the Cuban energy situation. The United States has not only put heavy sanctions on the Maduro government, which it no longer recognizes, uh, but has also put heavy sanctions on the shippers of oil from uh, Venezuela uh, to Cuba. Um, again, I'll, I'm going to go back and forth here um, between the Facebook page and the uh, my PowerPoint. So if you have any questions, uh, just feel free. Um, this is a, a graph we have here of um, uh, th this is where the Cuban doctors are serving abroad. I'll blow it up a little bit so you can see. Um, so you have Cuban doctors in 23 countries or, or so uh, treating coronavirus all over Latin America and the Caribbean in particular. A few countries in Africa, Cuba obviously has a very um, long-standing relationship with the government of Angola, which had fought uh, to help grant its in independence in the, the 70s uh, against the South Africans. Um, did the same in uh, Cabo Verde in, in the war in uh, Guinea-Bissau in the 1960s. Um, but you also see uh, Cuban doctors going to Italy as well, one of the hardest hit regions. Um, so Cuba in the news recently, Cuba 2020, um, the most recent piece of news out of, uh, involving Cuba was the, the embassy shooting. And I'll have some photos of that. That occurred just a couple days ago. You might not have heard of it uh, with all the, the news on uh, surrounding coronavirus. But there was a shooting at the Cuban embassy in Washington, D.C. Um, the Cuban government has called this a terrorist attack against the embassy. I think that's a bit premature a bit strong. Uh, what it appears is that there's a very um, severely uh, mentally ill man, uh, Cuban, uh, Cuban-born American, um, who had was hearing voices in his head and had previous stints at psychiatric hospitals uh, and things like that, and was not taking his um, the prescribed treatment to try to help his uh, his conditions, and he just he appeared to have a bit of a breakdown. And he took an AK-47 and he shot 32 rounds off at the Cuban embassy. Um, he was 
wearing an American flag. He had a uh, gasoline soaked Cuban flag, which he tried to light on fire, but it was raining. So he wasn't able to do that. I have a photo of that for you. Um, he was talking about Cuban organized crime being after him and real paranoid stuff. There, there is no organized crime in Cuba. Um, there's really not an ability for an organization of people to, uh, to organize themselves or assemble themselves outside of government functions. Um, so there is, there is no organized crime in Cuba. There hasn't been for 70 years, 60, 70 years since the American mafia was there. Um, so the Cuban government has, has labeled this as a terrorist attack by a Cuban American. Um, but I, you know, I, at this point, more investigation work needs to be done. It's not as if this, this attack was claimed by anti-Castro groups in Miami. This appears to be uh, a very mentally ill man having a bit of a breakdown and just, you know, uh, committing violence. Um, there was also a an episode on Showtime Vice News uh, called the Hub Cuban Hostage Crisis, and this is a really interesting episode talking about the um, the effect that the Trump administration's immigration policies have had, particularly on Cuban immigrants. Um, so the Remain in Mexico policy um, for political asylum. Uh, people who apply for um, political asylum, instead of waiting out their application in the United States, they've been forced to wait it out in Mexico. And Cubans are, are particularly vulnerable to violence in Mexico because there's a perception of them being wealthier immigrants, that they have wealthier family in Florida or the parts of the United States that would pay ransom if they're taken hostage. So many Cubans have found themselves kidnapped by drug cartels in Mexico and subject to hostage negotiations, uh, death threats, and other types of violence. Uh, so that's what the episode on uh, on Showtime discussed. Uh, Cuba, as I like to say, is a long 90 miles south of Florida. It's a very, very different place. Not sure if anyone watching has been there, uh, but it's a very, very different place from uh, the United States uh, for many reasons. Not only our political differences, uh, but widespread cultural differences as well, and our gender relations, uh, religion, religious issues, freedom of religion only came around in the 1990s after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, differences in, in how human rights are perceived from an individual basis to a uh, collective basis, you know, what we consider to have, to have our Bill of Rights in, in the United States is non-existent in Cuba, um, but Cuba also has universal health care, universal education, they don't have student debt, um, they have a lot of things that we don't have that they consider to be human rights. So it's a different viewpoint uh, on these types of issues. Um, up until the pandemic, American travel to Cuba remained 100% legal. You could just drive down to JFK and hop on a flight. Um, unfortunately, travel has been suspended indefinitely. Um, but it wasn't closed. It wasn't closed to Americans, as a lot of people thought. Uh, it was open. Uh, it's not dangerous. It's actually the safest country in the hemisphere, which is a, a misnomer. A lot of people think Cuba must be dangerous because of our, our preconceptions about Cuba, but it's actually extraordinarily safe. The Cuban people love the American people. Um, they, they think that we are we're good tippers, at least compared to some of the European travelers. Uh, they like to complain about the French too. Uh, but Cuban people are very warm, welcoming, friendly. Uh, they're tired of living under the sanctions uh, that we've imposed on them since Kennedy administration, um, but they're very happy for the most part. They're very happy people, warm, friendly, um, just enjoy living life. So next we have a uh, so photo I wanted to show you. This is of, uh, I'll check if we have any questions here. Um, any questions, just um, type them right into the comments here on our, our live stream. Um, this is a photo here. This is of Jose Mar the statue of Jose Marti. Uh, excuse me, let's come down here. Of Jose Marti, he's a national hero. He led what we know as the Spanish American War, which is really the third Cuban War of Independence uh, against Spain in the late 1890s. Um, and as you see, the the damage to the embassy that was done by the uh, the shooting of, as bullets ricocheted off the the column there. And if you look just uh, above. Uh, the waist of the statue on the right hand side that's a bullet hole it's right in the middle of the statue so the statue was struck um, this is a photo of the flag uh, 
that the shooter was carrying. Um, this was soaked in gasoline and he tried to light it on fire. Um, so these are clearly actions of somebody who was uh, mentally disturbed. And uh, we'll see how the, um, the charges play out, whether he um, takes a, you know, an insanity plea or something like that, but that's to be determined. So my goal in, um, in focusing on Cuba is to try to create uh, a policy from the United States that makes most sense um, in relation to our history. And I, I think in, in order to create a, um, a most effective policy from the United States that we need to be able to have an understanding of Cuban history. Uh, so that's what we're gonna talk about here. Um, so Cuba was a colony of Spain um, from the time Christopher Columbus landed in Cuba in, in the late 1490s to uh, about 400 years later. And when um, the Spanish were defeated in the Spanish-American War, and Cuba became a military occupation of the United States. It was the third Cuban War of Independence. There was a 10 years war from 1868 uh, to 1878, uh, what they call La Guerra Chiquita, the small war in 1882. And then later, uh, the third war, which you might have heard of Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders um, in Santiago de Cuba and San Juan Hill. And that was this war, it was the Spanish-American War. I uh, remember the Maine, the ship in Havana that was blown up, that instigated Americans uh, getting themselves involved in the war. So um, uh, after this war uh, ended, which uh, was ended in Paris, um, negotiation between Spain and the United States uh, and the Treaty of Paris in 1898, handed control of Cuba to the United States. And we occupied them militarily from 1898 to 1902. Uh, at which time we granted them independence. But we put a clause in their constitution called the Platt Amendment, uh, which said that the United States had the right to intervene in Cuba at any time. Uh, and we did um, many times throughout the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and the effect of this really had the opposite of what it was intended to do, which instead of training uh, the Cubans to be um, a civilized democracy, in the words of 120 years ago, um, if really, um, the Cuban people took a hands-off approach and thought that any problem, well, the Americans are going to solve it for us. So it had the opposite effect that it was intended to. And this was a very turbulent time in Cuban history. First half of the 20th century saw the Cuban government overthrown a number of times. Um, every four years when they had elections, they were very turbulent, very violent times because, um, only a minority of the population was able to vote. So the United States set the suffrage rules in Cuba to be similar to what we had in the late 1700s, which was for uh, white male landowners were the ones who were able to vote. Uh, so the population viewed the election results uh, as inaccurate, as not a true reflection of what the population wanted. Um, so there was a lot of violence, a lot of turbulence around the Cuban electoral system. Um, this resulted in the government being overthrown in uh, 1933. Um, President Machado at the time, Gerardo Machado, he had tried to extend his term and just stay in office indefinitely. Um, and this was countered by what was called the Sergeant's Revolt in September of 1933. It was actually an earlier revolt in August of 1933 when Machado was removed. And then that president was overthrown again in September, the following month by Fulgencio Batista, who would later become the, the dictator in the 1950s. But Batista's first go around in 1933, um, he oversaw what was called a pentarchy. So he ruled Cuba through a series of, of puppet governments, of puppet presidents throughout the 1930s. And in 1940, he actually implemented a rather progressive uh, new constitution uh, supporting workers' rights and, and things like that. Um, but in the 1940s, when Batista left the scene, the new governments that came into power were considered to be kleptocracies. Uh, and they came into power with the idea of just stealing from the national treasury. They were not in it for the good of the Cuban people. Uh, there were instances where the president's wife won the lottery on Christmas and things like that would occur. Um, so uh, by, the by the time 1952 rolls around, Batista says, this isn't the government that I left the country with. I need to come back. I need to take over. I need to be president again. But it was very clear that he was not going to win the 1952 elections, which were scheduled to take place in June. So in March of 1952, 
March 10th, 1952, he gets the power of the military behind him and declares himself to be president in a military coup. And Batista remained president uh, of the country unelected uh, until Castro took over in 1959. Um, so at this time, Fidel Castro was running in, uh, he was running for Cuban's version of Congress in uh, 1952, he was 26 years old. And the coup d'etat that took place under Batista just enraged Castro. Um, so he uh, he got a, a band of uh, fellow soldiers together, and he attacked a military base in Mancara, which is in eastern Cuba, on July 26, 1953. Uh, and it was a spectacular failure. But what it did was his arrest catapulted him to national fame as this person who was standing against the Batista dictatorship. And he, he went on trial, and he gave a very famous speech saying, history will absolve me. And he was sent to prison until 1955 on Isla de Juventud, which is a little island south of the mainland Cuba, until uh, under public pressure, Batista released him. Uh, Castro went to Mexico uh, with Raul Castro, his brother, to where he met Che Guevara. Um, and this was a very, um, very particular time in Latin American history because in 1954, you had just seen the overthrow of Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala who was a democratically elected socialist president. And um, he had crossed Dwight Eisenhower and the United Fruit Company and John Dulles, uh, and the CIA stepped in to overthrow him. So Castro recognized that it, it doesn't really matter what type of government um, the country of Cuba or any other country would, would form, that if you're not aligning with US interests, that there's, there's a threat to have you overthrown. Uh, the same thing was witnessed in 1953 uh, with Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran, who had nationalized American and British oil interests before the CIA came in and overthrew him. So Castro and uh, his brother Raul and Che, um, they eventually leave Mexico and they uh, uh, they take their boat called Grandma over to Cuba in, uh, in November of 1956. Um, and they sweep the island over the course of a couple of years. They gradually get the population behind them, um, calling for things like general strikes and their famous radio broadcast from the mountains, um, really revving up the anti-Batista charge. Uh, because Batista was not a very popular uh, president among the Cuban people. Um, he was certainly in bed with the American mafia and American big business there. So you were either making a lot of money with Batista or you were not very happy with him because of his human rights violations. Um, lack of freedom of speech, uh, lack of um, the uh, uh, education rates on the island, the, Ill the illiteracy rate was quite high. Um, people didn't have access to food and health care. Lots of discrimination against minorities. Um, so Castro was able to um, gain the support of the population and the tide turned in his favor. The United States eventually put an arms embargo on Batista. They put an arms embargo on Cuba, but it was really an arms embargo on Batista as they allowed weapons to continue to flow to Castro. Um, the Cuban Revolution triumphs January of 1959. And it's very important to recognize that the Cuban Revolution was an anti-colonial revolution. It wasn't a communist revolution that was trying to take power from the beginning, uh, but it was a revolution that was trying to gain the independence of Cuba for the first time so that their economic and political structures wouldn't be dedicated to the benefit of a foreign country as it had been throughout Cuba's uh, existence since the Spanish colonies uh, in the late 1400s. So the idea of the Castro revolution was um, in his mind, he views himself as the 20th century version of Jose Marti trying to deliver independence to the island. Um, but the 1960s are a very turbulent time in Cuban history. You had uh, the Escambray revolution uh, rebellion, which was a group of soldiers who had fought with Fidel Castro, led by William Morgan, who's an American. There's a documentary on PBS, which I'd recommend, about William Morgan. Uh, and they looked around and they said, you know, what Castro has established is not what we fought for. We fought for democracy. We didn't fight for the Soviets to be here. Um, and the CIA was actually supportive of the Escambray Revolution uh, Rebellion. Um, but they were defeated. Morgan was executed. His body wasn't returned to the United States until um, about 10 or 15 years ago. So you had a, a, a second civil war after the triumph of the revolution. 
you had the Bay of Pigs invasion uh, by the United States. So over the course of the first years of the revolution, the United States tried to get along with Castro, who actually met with Richard Nixon, who was the vice president at the time. Um, but it was very clear that the United States and, and Cuban interests were not going to be aligning as Castro refused to stop refining Soviet oil. Um, they nationalized American business interests, along with interests of many other countries. Um, they implemented land reform, uh, which tried to seize and redistribute land more equally across the country. So there was a point where about 75% of the land in Cuba was owned by 8% of the population. So that the aim of agrarian reform was to try to correct that. Uh, so that meant a lot of American business owners losing their businesses uh, and a lot of Cuban business owners um, you know, losing their land uh, and eventually migrating to the United States. Um, so you had the this invasion of the Bay at the Bay of Pigs by John F. Kennedy, um, which was a massive failure. Uh, and it really spurred Fidel Castro to form an alliance with the Soviet Union. So the, the cause of the Cuban Missile Crisis was uh, Castro wanted to defend his island against a second American invasion, which wouldn't have been mercenaries as it was at the first uh, Bay of Pigs invasion, but it would have been the U.S. Marines. And he knew that the very existence of his revolution, of his new government, was at stake. So he allowed the Soviets to place missiles on the island, uh, pointing them at the United States, uh, and we had the Cuban Missile Crisis um, in October of 62. This was eventually resolved um, as Kennedy and Khrushchev were able to strike a deal for the Soviets to remove their missiles and the United States removed uh, American missiles out of Turkey. Um, but as I noted in the end of the Spanish-American War, which was negotiated between the Spanish and the United States and Harris, um, this was the Cuban Missile Crisis was negotiated between the Soviets and the Americans without the uh, participation of the Cubans, which very much angered uh, Fidel Castro. He didn't speak to the Soviet ambassador for a week afterwards. Um, so, but that was the formation of the, uh, um, the sometimes tenuous Cuban alliance with the Soviet Union. Um, they certainly were at odds oftentimes over foreign policy. Castro didn't always take the advice of the Soviets on domestic economic policy, um, but it was always a relationship that the Soviets were never able to abandon, because how, how could they wake up and look at the world the next day having abandoned um, the Cuban socialist experiments just 90 miles away from the United States? So they felt that they had to put up with Castro even when uh, he wasn't always getting along with them, and he was quite expensive. They funneled hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to the Cuban economy just to keep it afloat. Uh, after the heavy sanctions imposed by the United States. Uh, so we had the missile crisis. And then in the 19, uh, still in the 1960s, we had what were called UMAP camps. UMAP was a Spanish acronym um, for military re-education camps. Um, so I'll go back and I'll check. Um, see, we have a few people joining us today after nine. Thank you, everybody. Um, any questions, just shout it right out as we go. Um, and uh, so the UMAP camps, uh, let's go from current slide, um, were military re-education camps that were implemented by the Cuban government. Um, and what they did was they took people who were gay, who were religious, who were outside of the social norm in Cuba, who were outside of the, the new revolutionary mindset, uh, and they put them in these re-education camps. Um, I would not compare them to the concentration camps in, in under the Nazis or um, if you know history of the Spanish-American War, the camps that were run by Valeriano Weiler in the in Cuba in the late 1800s, um, these weren't death camps, but um, they certainly weren't something that the Cubans would end up being very proud of. Um, there were somewhere between one and 20 deaths in these camps. Um, the Cuban numbers have it a little lower than some other historical figures, um, but they weren't in the thousands. They were, um, you know, 10 or 20. Um, and it was something that the, the Cuban government, Fidel Castro actually later apologized for the existence of these camps. Uh, in the 1960s, as you can see, a lot of turbulence between international crisis, the civil war, et cetera. Um, this is where Cuba gets a lot of its human rights reputations from. Um, and just as Cuba is not the same country that it was in the 1960s, neither is um, the United States. We're not the same country we were in the 1960s uh, with segregation and, and all those types of issues. Uh, so Cuba has certainly come a long way on the uh, issue of human rights, particularly on religious freedoms and, and gay rights. And that's something we'll talk a little bit more about as we go.
Also in the 1960s, um, you had the attempted export of the Cuban Revolution. The idea was that Cuba wanted to create many more Cubas, whether it's across Latin America or different countries in Africa, because they felt their, their, that their negotiation um, stance vis-a-vis -vis the, the United States would be much stronger if they had to contend with two, three, or four, or five revolutionary governments, um, either across Latin America or Africa or other, other places in the world. So you saw Cuban participation uh, in Che's attempted export of the revolution in Zaire, um, which fell flat, and then he was killed in Bolivia when he was trying to do the same thing. Um, the successful war in Guinea-Bissau, um, really the success of the, the Cuban wars at this point in time were against the Portuguese colonies in Africa, namely Guinea-Bissau, which was a, a revolution led by Avrical Cabral, which is somebody, uh, Avri, Av, excuse me, Alvi Clark Cabral, which is somebody who really does not get the recognition in history that he should. It's definitely somebody worth um, Googling um, Cabral in Guinea-Bissau. And then later in Angola, when the Cubans faced off uh, against the South African troops, uh, Cuba actually sent troops to fight in the Angolan Civil War. Um, so Portugal was uh, in charge of Angola as a colony, and there was a move towards independence, but there were three groups in Angola that were fighting one another. Um, there was the MPLA, the UNITA, and the FALN. And the MPLA was backed by the Cubans and the Soviets. Um, and then the other two factions were backed by the Americans and the South Africans. But the Americans weren't big on associating with the South Africans at that point in time. Um, so there was a lot of covert work that was done. A really good book on this uh, by Piero Glaheses called Conflicting Missions, which talks about Cuba's history in Africa in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and long story short, the Cubans, uh, Cuban troops faced off against the South African troops. South Africa, of course, an apartheid state at this point in time. Uh, and the Cuban troops defeated the South Africans um, and helped the MPLA uh, emerge as the victorious faction uh, in the Angolan Civil War. A oh, civil war that would carry on for um, decades after that. But the MPLA were the ones who emerged in the 1970s. Um, so uh, when we talk about in the 1970s and on, as far as Cuba policy in the United States, it was uh, at least under Ford and Carter, and act later on with Reagan too, this, Cuba's adventures, in, particularly in Africa, were um, a sticking point in, in preventing uh, relations moving forward. Uh, Gerald Ford in particular talked about uh, that because of Cubans' adventures in Africa and Latin America, and Cuban support for Puerto Rican independence movements, um, he was not not even considering talks, um, normalizing relations with Castro. Uh, Jimmy Carter took a little bit of a different approach. Uh, Jimmy Carter opened a U.S. interest section in Havana, uh, which is an embassy in a country that we don't uh, have diplomatic relations with. Um, Castro and uh, Cuban government opened a, a uh, Cuban interest section in Washington, D.C. Uh, both buildings present, present day are the embassies. Um, but again, the sticking points over African policy really prevented the Carter normalization from moving forward. Uh, but there was some progress that was made. There was a famous banker named Bernardo Benes uh, in Miami, um, who he worked to facilitate talks between Castro and Carter. And to even consider engaging with the Cuban government at this point, uh, he put his life on the line to do so, um, really from, with, from the death threats he would get in Miami. And, uh, he convinced Fidel Castro to release thousands of political prisoners out of his prisons uh, in, in Cuba and uh, with the idea that they would um, go to the United States as refugees. But the Carter administration insisted on vetting them one by one by one, which took a lot longer than anticipated. So Castro thought that this was some kind of plot to have him release all of these anti-government forces throughout the country and have some kind of CIA revolt against him. Um, so there were a number of issues, number of blunders um, from Carter's well-intentioned efforts to normalize relations with, uh, with Castro. Uh, Carter sent a Coca-Cola executive to negotiate on his behalf to send a message to, to Castro, uh, but he didn't know that this particular Coca-Cola executive had dementia. Uh, so Castro was very confused when this, uh, this confused American representative came and started talking to him actually invited Castro to the White House for Christmas. Um, so a couple funny stories that came out of that. 
Um, but when Reagan came into office, he actually offered a, a normalization deal to Fidel Castro. And what he did um, was he, he said that um, uh, that if the Cubans kicked the Soviets out of Cuba, and if the Cubans pulled out of their activities in Africa, that uh, that the United States would be able to normalize relations with Cuba. This obviously at the time was not acceptable to the Cuban government. They were not about to negotiate their foreign policy, uh, which they had made clear from the previous American administrations. Uh, and they, they needed the Soviet economic lifeline just to stay afloat. Uh, so this was a non-starter. But what happens at the end of the, uh, at the end of the decade is there's a deal reached between Cuba and South Africa and Namibia um, to grant Namibia an independence. Namibia had been Southwest Africa, which was um, a colony more or less uh, occupied by the South Africans. Uh, and as part of the negotiations for normalization, um, Namibia was granted independence. So Cuba no longer had a reason to, to continue military activity in Africa. So the Cubans pulled out of Africa and the Soviet Union collapses and pulls out of Cuba. So Cuba turns to the United States, who at this point, George H.W. Bush is president and says, hey, what about our normalization deal? Uh, because George H.W. Bush had been president, uh, been, excuse me, had been vice president under Ronald Reagan. And George H.W. Bush looks at, at the situation and he says, what do I need you for? The Sandinistas were defeated. Uh, so I don't need you in Latin America. I have this communist uh, uh, bloc, the socialist bloc in Eastern Europe is falling left and right. Um, the fall of the Soviet unions, all these, all the, the Soviet republics are becoming independent democracies or intended to be democracies. Um, so he didn't need a normalization deal with Cuba and they were happy to let Castro fall if, they, if he was going to be next. And there, there was some speculation that he was going to be next. Uh, so the United States takes the opposite approach and they tighten the Cuban embargo. They implement what was called the Cuban Democracy Act, which says that to normalize relations with Cuba, that Fidel and Raul had to resign and Cuba had to implement a multi-party democracy. Um, and relations really didn't go, <laughs> they didn't take a jump start from there. Um, Clinton comes into office and he recognizes that the, the negotiations, the engagement with China that Nixon had taken with Mao was a path towards success. Nixon, uh, excuse me, Clinton actually normalized his relations with Vietnam, where some 60,000 Americans had been killed. The war had ended there only about 20 years earlier. But he takes an aggressive approach with Cuba because he wants to get reelected in 1996. Um, so he signs what's called the Helms Burton Act which was, um, if anyone saw the uh, documentary, The Last Dance with Michael Jordan, the Senator Jesse Helms from North Carolina is mentioned in that. And Michael Jordan famously wouldn't uh, come out supporting his opponent vocally as much as uh, some folks had wanted him to. Um, but Jesse Helms, he was him and Dan Burton as a Senator from Indiana, they signed this law that globalized the Cuban embargo that's um, said to the rest of the world that you can either do business with Cuba or you can do business with the United States. And if you choose to do business with Cuba, then your executives are not allowed to even enter the United States and American companies cannot do business with you. So if you're a foreign company, you can do business with a poor communist country of 10 million people, or you can do with a business with the largest economy in the world, a capitalist country of 300 million people. Who are you going to pick? And that's why if you go to Cuba, or when things open up again, if you do go to Cuba, you won't see foreign, or you won't see many foreign businesses there. You won't see chains there. You won't see McDonald's or Starbucks or any foreign chains um, because everyone, or almost everybody, chooses to do business uh, in the United States. The 1990s also saw the Elian Gonzalez affair, which was a, a little five-year-old boy who ended up stranded in the United States after the raft that his mother had tried to bring him over on um, sunk and his mother was killed. Uh, and his father in Cuba wanted him back. His family in the United States um, said they wanted to keep him in the United States and it became a huge international incident. Uh, the case actually went all the way to the Supreme Court, which ruled that Elian needed to go back to Cuba his five-year-olds are not going to be political refugees because he's five. Um, so he was taken a gunpoint from the United States and flown back to Cuba uh, to be reunited with his father, where 
uh, he is today. You also have the um, Brothers to the Rescue shoot down. There were a number of planes that were flying out of South Florida. They would fly over the Florida Straits looking for refugees, um, so-called Brothers to the Rescue. Um, but they wouldn't just do that. They would fly over the Havana, the Cuban capital, and drop anti-Castro leaflets. Uh, now imagine if Cuba had sent planes to buzz the uh, buzz Washington D.C. and the Pentagon and the White House. They would be shot down. Uh, but there was uh, upwards of 23 warnings given from Cuban government to the American government that they were not going to continue to tolerate the flyover of these brothers to the rescue planes. Eventually, one of them was shot down by the Cuban government. Uh, three Americans were killed, and it was another uh, international incident between Cuba and the United States with the American blame going towards Cuba and against Castro. And that further prevented uh, normalization of relations. Um, so we'll fast forward to uh, President Obama's Cuba deal. Uh, if anybody has any questions, again, feel free. Um, to we're up to 12 people now. It's excellent. Um, so what does President Obama do? Oh, well, briefly, there's not a lot to cover with the George W. Bush administration um, with the Cuban government. Uh, during the Bush administration, um, very tense relations. The Bush administration supported Cuban dissidents who were actively organizing with the Cuban embassy, or excuse, with the American embassy. Um, and they were, there was over 75 or so of them were arrested uh, on the eve of the Iraq war. That's why it didn't get a lot of news coverage in the United States. Um, but just to, to undermine the Cuban government, um, really there was not any progress made in term, terms of normalization. It was more of the same failed policies of pushing for democracy and, and change that just hasn't occurred. Um, Fidel Castro did get sick in 2006. He handed over power temporarily to his brother, Raul, who became officially became president in 2008. Um, this goes back to what I was talking about before, is that Cuba recognizes, um, recognized that it didn't matter what type of government that uh, Cuba had, at, if they became a democracy, uh, and let's say you had a communist party versus a capitalist party or something like that, that they thought the United States would intervene and that they couldn't, they weren't secure enough that they could just hold an election without American intervention. As they witnessed previously, not only in Guatemala and Iran in the 50s, but uh, Salvador Allende in the 1970s, uh, democratically elected socialist overthrown by the CIA. So when Cuba heard this argument, oh, you know, if, if you were just a multi-party democracy that we would normalize relations with you, they didn't buy it because history has shown that the America had no problem overthrowing democratically elected leaders that um, they didn't have aligned interests with. Um, so we move along to President Obama's deal. Um, President Obama on December 17, 2014, announced that the United States would be moving towards normal relationships uh, with Cuba for the first time. Um, over 400 years of history in Cuba and the United States had never had a normal relationship. Uh, there was a brief period of time at the beginning of the Castro government, 1959-1960, where there was somewhat of a normal relationship, um, but obviously that quickly deteriorated. Um, he announced this in, um, with a, a spy swap. So there were three Cuban spies that were left in the United States. There's a group of five of them that had um, been convicted on a variety of charges. Um, they were known as the Cuban Five. Um, two of them had been back in Cuba already, but the remaining three were released. And there were two American spies that were traded back to the United States. One was an American named Alan Gross, who was, had been convicted of working for the CIA. Uh, he had accepted uh, half a million dollars to run um, satellite and uh, communications and different spyware equipment to Cuba. Uh, and then there was another... Um, and a Cuban spy named, I believe his name was Rolando Saraf Trujillo, something like that. And he uh, he had been in a Cuban jail for about 25 years, uh, convicted on spying, on spying for the United States. He only wasn't executed because his parents were very prominent in the Cuban government. So he'd been allowed to serve a life sentence, but he was eventually uh, released and traded as part of the deal. Um, President Obama, he created this um, this new perception of Cuba in the United States, that Cuba would be open to Americans. And there was a huge wave in travel, uh, demand for travel to come visit Cuba for the first time, you know, 55, 60 years of pent up demand 
to travel and see the island. There's a, a large wave of Americans wanting to see Cuba before it changes. So that, you know, I would hear a lot, I want to get here before Starbucks does. Uh, Starbucks still hasn't arrived there. Uh, but Cuba was changing every day, and there was an expansion of telecommunication services. Governor Cuomo brought Verizon to Cuba uh, for the first time. Governor Cuomo um, actually, he visited Cuba. He not only brought Verizon with him, but he brought Pepsi. Um, so it, for those who've been to Cuba, you'll know that Coca-Cola is everywhere on the island. Um, but Coca-Cola denies that they sell any uh, products in Cuba. They they sell all, they sell you know twice as what they need, as much as, they need to to Mexico, and then Mexico sells it to Cuba. That's how they they work around that. So the CEO of Pepsi sees this uh, and says, "I want in." And six months later, they're funneling Pepsi through Guatemala uh, to come to Cuba. Obviously, they're not allowed to sell uh, products directly to Cuba, uh, but that's how they got around it. So there was a lot of interesting developments. There was hundreds of uh, universities, over four hundred universities in America. Uh, in the United States, uh, signed deals with the University of Havana to have students study there. Um, this was just an unprecedented uh, opening of the American relationship since the, re the revolution. Um, you saw businessmen from across the United States come and exploring deals. Um, the embargo wasn't lifted. The embargo still hasn't been lifted. The embargo can only be lifted by Congress. Those laws that I talked about with Bill Clinton uh, and Helms Burton, that took the embargo out of the president's hands. It had been an executive order until then, and it, it handed that power to Congress. Uh, and in the final uh, two years of the Obama administration, uh, he had an opposition Congress that was not about to lift the embargo. Uh, but the partisan uh, divide on Cuba is something we'll talk about in a, in a few few slides from now. It's not as not as straight Republican and Democrat as people think it is. Uh, president Obama became the first president to visit Cuba since 1928 when Calvin Coolidge had visited. He took a warship over to Cuba. Uh, at this time, there was prohibition in the United States, so anytime there was a press photographer near him, he couldn't be seen drinking any Cuban rum. Uh, Major League Baseball came and played a game in Cuba. The Tampa Bay Rays played the Cuban national team in an exhibition game, and Tampa Bay won. Um, Cuba, if you remember the movie 42 about Jackie Robinson, um, so the spring training that Jackie Robinson attends with the Dodgers, his first one, that took place at Pedro Marrero Stadium, which is in Havana. Uh, so Jackie Robinson uh, actually made his debut for the Dodgers in Cuba, which is something that is often missed. Uh, the Rolling Stones came and played a concert in Cuba. It was free. It was open to the public. I was very lucky to be there. It was also at the baseball game in the U.S. Embassy section. Um, but I was at the, the Rolling Stones concert. Uh, it was the only concert I've ever been to where nobody knew the words, but it was uh, really emotional, very, um, really meaningful for the Cuban people. You would, I, I think of my, my good friend Richard, who is he's probably in his mid 50s. Um, he's a bartender. He'd never been outside of Cuba before, and he'd never seen anybody like, you know, like the Rolling Stones or any of the famous pop groups or, you know, um, major acts like that. Nobody ever came to Cuba. Uh, and it would happen to be his birthday, and he came and saw the Rolling Stones play, and it was just, um, it was a moment that him and, and all the other Cubans who were there would never forget. Uh, but when they made the announcement in Havana, people were crying and dancing in the streets. It was a moment that they had waited for for, for 55 years, um, you know, two generations waiting for a relation, uh, an announcement of normal relations with the United States. Um, in Miami, it was very much the opposite. I have a... Uh, Cuban friend who happened to be visiting family in Miami at the time. Uh, and they tell me about uh, how excited they were when the announcement came, the surprise announcement on TV, um, wanting to jump for joy and scream and hug everybody. Um, but their family was gloom and doom and just so upset about um, the, the normalization announcement. Uh, while Fidel Castro was still alive, while Raul Castro was still the president, while without Cuba having a democracy. So there was certainly a lot of um, mixed reactions across uh, the Florida Straits. Uh, we'll move on to uh, President Trump in the present day. Uh, he announced a cancelization of Obama's Cuba deal. Um, Major League Baseball's deal got canceled as well. Major League Baseball had a deal to prevent human trafficking of Cuban players to the United States, as American companies are not allowed to hire Cuban citizens. Uh, it goes for baseball teams as well. So if a Cuban player wants to play in the United States, they need to defect from Cuba and establish residency in a third country. 
not the U.S. or Canada, because if they went to the U.S. or Canada, they'd be subject to the um, Major League Baseball draft, and they couldn't make nearly as much as they could signing as an international free agent. But this created human trafficking issues with human player with um, the Cuban baseball players. Uh, if you look at the stories of Jose Abreu or um, Yasiel Pui getting kidnapped, um, there's a lot of really scary things that happen, and Major League Baseball didn't want to see that continue. Um, but President Trump canceled Major League Baseball's deal. He told Major League Baseball that if they helped out with the situation in Venezuela, he consider reinstating it. Um, you know what Major League Baseball is going to do in Venezuela. I, I couldn't imagine, and uh, the 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 deal has not been reinstated. Um, but the attempted regime change and the heavy sanctions in Venezuela um, have really deeply impacted Cuba, uh, cutting off or severely restricting Cuba's ability to import Venezuelan oil. Uh, Cuba, of course, uh, recognizes Nicolas Maduro, who is the successor uh, to Hugo Chavez, his very close friend and ally of Fidel Castro. The United States has recognized the government of Juan Guaido. Um, Juan Guaido is the equivalent of Nancy Pelosi in Cuba, and he objected to Nicolas Maduro's power grab. Um, Nicolas Maduro, um, he overhauled the Venezuelan constitution to give himself a lot more power, and Juan Guaido was not about that. Um, so he actually declared himself to be president of, of, of Venezuela, um, and he was recognized by some 60 countries around the world. About two-thirds of countries in the UN still recognize the Maduro government, but many of Venezuela's neighbors and many countries in the hemisphere have recognized uh, the Guaido government, including Colombia, Brazil, United States. So this has really created um, a tough situation for Cuba. Uh, the United States also eliminated the people to people travel. Uh, so traveling to Cuba, um, there's only two countries in the world that have a travel ban that the United States tells it's our, that tells American citizens that we're banned from traveling to. Uh, one is North Korea, which we're not allowed to travel to at all. And the other was Cuba, which was there were 12 categories of approved travel. There's now 11. Uh, and people to people travel was one of them. And with people to people travel was um, that was you would just you would certify that your travel, the purpose of your travel to Cuba was for an individual educational experience. Uh, but that doesn't exist anymore. So if you want to go on an educational experience, you have to go through a school that has a study abroad program in Cuba. Um, how regular Americans were able to travel to Cuba after that was by going for the support for the Cuban people category which means that you were traveling to Cuba um, with a full-time itinerary that was designed to support the Cuban private sector. Um, and that's what I did. I, I used to run people to people tours when they were uh, available. Um, but my, I, my, for my profession, I was running support for the Cuban people tours. So we would go and we would support Cuban entrepreneurs, like um, artists, musicians, taxi drivers, uh, the 1950s classic convertible car drivers and drive around uh, with a top down in Havana, uh, the private restaurants, uh, private speakers talking about um, Cuban economics and all sorts of different things. Uh, but that's that's the support for the Cuban people. So that remained um, legal. President Trump threatened a, quote, full and complete embargo against Cuba. No one really knows what that means, but he did tweet it out. Uh, and he has put heavy sanctions on the island. There's something called the Cuban Restricted List. Uh, which uh, is a, it's a list of entities that Americans are not allowed to engage with financially. So as a travel provider, there's a number of hotels and I'm not allowed to put you in because the American government says you're not allowed to stay there. The reason you're not allowed to stay there is because those governments um, have a deal mostly with Gaviota. Gaviota is a Cuban military tourism wing. Uh, so it's how the Part of how the Cuban military funds itself is through tourism, and Gaviota is the agency that does that, and they have a contract with a number of different hotels. Um, but the most devastating thing that I think uh, the Trump administration has done with Cuba has been the, uh, the activation of Title III of Helms-Burton. Um, so what this does is when we talked about um, the, the business reforms that Castro took over, nationalizing the businesses in the 1960s, so if you were um, a citizen of any other country except the United States, you eventually worked out a deal with, with the Cuban government uh, for a check uh, for your property, you, you know, accepting uh, the nationalization of your property for X value, market value. But Americans never accepted uh, 
any payment for their properties because the American government has always forbidden um, this type of deal. The, the Cuban government has always offered checks, has always offered money for the properties that they nationalized, but the American government has always uh, forbidden the American claimants from receiving any money from the Cuban government. At first, this was because there was a thought that the Cuban government wouldn't be around very long, so there was no sense in recognizing their nationalization. Um, but uh, later on, it became a political move um, and has resulted in an issue called the property claims. So these are all of the claims that have yet to be paid um, from when they were nationalized in the 60s. Uh, the U.S. government nationalized the claims, so they are in charge of negotiating these claims with the Cuban government. Um, so what Title III does was uh, if you're a third country, if you're, say, a Russian oil company, and you want to go um, open a business on what used to be the Texaco oil plant in Havana, in, in Cuba, um, Texaco has a claim on that property because they were never compensated for it. So Title III says if there is a Russian or a foreign, any, any country, um, company trafficking on Texaco's stolen property that Texaco is able to sue that, say, Russian oil company in American courts. Um, and this, uh, this was a very devastating move for the Cuban economy because it prevented foreign investment into the country. No one wants to invest in a property if they think that they're going to be sued in American courts over it. And even if you were able to get around Title III uh, of Helms-Burton, and by investing in properties that are not affected by the title by the property claims, that then you can still be hit with Title IV, which bans your executives from entering the United States. So Helms Burton is a very thorny law um, that has really been successful in preventing foreign investment into Cuba. Um, John Bolton, the former National Security Advisor for the Trump administration, gave a speech labeling Cuba as part of the Troika of tyranny in the Western Hemisphere, along with uh, Nicaragua and Venezuela. Um, in my opinion, I think they have eyes on regime change in Cuba, um, possibly in a second term. I think that um, the Guaido experiment was a test run in Venezuela. It hasn't been very successful there. Um, but if they do see more success, I, I think the Cuban revolution could face an existential crisis uh, under a second term of, of President Trump. Um, head back over here for a moment. All right, any questions, um, you know, shout them right out. We're very happy to have um, you with us. Uh, are we still with us? with us? Have we stopped? Can you, can anybody hear me? I, I'm getting a message saying, sorry, we're having trouble playing this video. So I wanted to, uh, check on that. Hello. Hey, can you can you hear my video? I'm getting a message saying sorry we're having trouble playing a video. Oh yeah, I can hear it fine. So you're we're good to go? Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll keep going. Yeah, it's going fine on my end. All right. Yeah. All right, bye bye. All right, we'll uh, we'll keep rolling along here. Um it's got a weird error message on Facebook, but we'll uh, we'll keep rolling along. So thank you to everybody who's sticking with us. Um, so on that note, it's more important than ever for Americans to, uh, to keep an eye on what's going on in Cuba, and particularly in light of the recent uh, embassy shooting, uh, the closure uh, to the island of foreign tourists. Um, you know, Cuba, Cuba's going through a very difficult time with shortages and sanctions. Um, it's, it's turning into a humanitarian crisis on the island. And it's important to keep in mind because Cuba is a domestic policy that's designed to win Florida. It's not a normal foreign policy that we have like we have towards any other country. It's a particularly designed to win Florida every four years and the very important swing state of Florida in our presidential elections. That's why this, only the United States takes this aggressive stance against Cuba because no other country has such an important electoral factor riding on this one particular policy. Uh, so American travelers were playing a um, a unique role, uniquely important role in supporting Cuba's private sector under the Cuban support, uh, support for the Cuban people uh, travel category. Um, 
because uh, travelers from other parts of the world, like Europe and Canada, they would go to the, the beach resorts and they wouldn't be spending time uh, supporting the Cuban private sector like the Americans had. Um, what, the, what was shown was that 90% of Americans returning from Cuba supported lifting the embargo, which is part of the motivation towards clamping down on Carnival Cruise Lines, the, the cruise lines, the Cuba cruises that were canceled, and restricting uh, travel, uh, eliminating people to people, and things like that. They wanted to create an atmosphere that would discourage Americans from traveling to Cuba without outright banning them because Cuban Americans need to travel to Cuba to visit their family. Religious institutions were going down there. So there are a number of categories that they wanted to keep going, but they wanted your typical American without a special purpose of going there who just wanted to take a vacation. The administration was uh, discouraging people from doing that. Um, and it's important to recognize that our Cuba policy affects our broader Latin American relationships. Um, this was particularly true under the Obama administration uh, and the Organization of American States, the meetings that we would have. Um, there was a very strong message sent to the United States that if we didn't turn around our Cuba policy, that the U.S. wouldn't be welcomed at the OAS meetings. That is seemingly reversed now with the Trump administration in power. Um, you know, certainly Brazil has taken an anti-Cuba stance, kicking out Cuban doctors, 40,000 Cuban doctors kicked out of Brazil, which is a major loss for the Cuban economy. Colombia, Ecuador, um, countries that are turning on Venezuela. So it certainly wasn't the pro-Cuba atmosphere of a couple of years ago uh, under the Obama administration. But our Cuba policy certainly does uh, impact our broader Latin American relationships. Um, if you do end up going to Cuba, uh, you'll see American nostalgia everywhere. Uh, Ernest Hemingway in the 1950s, um, he, you know, he, he lived in Cuba. He had a house there, so you can go visit his house. It's a beautiful museum these days, a little baseball field out front where they have a little league. Um, plenty of 1950s cars. I'll show you some photos of that. Uh, Hotel Nacional, as you remember from the Godfather movie. Um, and really a polar opposite way of living. Um, very collective focus. There's not this idea of, you know, going and getting a high paying career job and climbing up a corporate ladder and moving out and buying a house. There's no access to credit in Cuba. So there's no mortgages. So you can't just go buy a house. You live in your family's house and your focus is on your family. Your focus is on you know spending time with your grandkids and enjoying the things that you have in life. Cause there really isn't that corporate ladder structure to climb that we have here in the U S. Um, Cuba has a very highly intelligent population really in touch with global affairs. Um, sometimes we think of Cuba as cut off from the rest of the world, but that's not the case at all. Cubans are very well connected. Um, they have millions of Cubans have relatives in the United States and vice versa. So Cubans are very well connected to what's going on here uh, from conversations I have with their American family. Um, while the flights were going on, there were uh, there's something called El Paquete, which was a US, uh, USB flash drive that would come down into Cuba uh, with the latest episodes of what was new on Netflix and um, Anderson Cooper and all these different types of shows. The Cubans are really well informed and very well educated about what's going on in the world. Um, there's a small Jewish community, about a thousand people uh, in Havana that you can go and support. Very popular to do so. The Jewish community really was not affected by the um, the religious backlash in Cuba, the, the crackdown on religious beliefs during the revolutionary time. Um, the Cuban government was well aware of its reputation as a human rights violator, particularly with religious freedom, and they didn't want to add anti-Semitism to that list. So they, for the most part, left the Jewish community alone. Um, you'll see a lot of music, art, dancing, baseball, it's everywhere. You're surrounded by music and dancing in Cuba. Everywhere you go, art is everywhere, very popular, um, very um, considered a very prestigious thing to be a Cuban artist. And baseball is, our, is their national pastime. It's a national pastime that we share, and it's a good way to um, cross those cultural boundaries through a um, uh, mutual love of baseball and a shared national pastime. Old Havana, of course, you remember President Obama when he visited Cuba, his stroll, famous stroll through Old Havana, the cobblestone streets. I'll show you some photos of that out to the tobacco fields as well in Western Cuba. Vinales is very popular, a little town out west where they grow the tobacco uh, and forbidden rum and cigars you know you can't get cuban rum or cigars in the united states at least not in, in stores 
um, beaches. Americans aren't supposed to go to Cuban beaches due to the travel ban from the United States. Cubans don't care. Um, but as far as the American tourism ban goes, you're not supposed to spend a week on the, the Cuban beach resorts. But uh, yeah, I've had a client or two that has explored heading out there. Um, some photos to show you. Um, this is a Wi-Fi hotspot. So there really is a lack of private Wi-Fi in Cuba. It's certainly growing at this point. It's gotten much better. But the introduction of Wi-Fi to Cuba um, was through these public hotspots where people would gather. You pay a dollar or two an hour to go on the internet, check your email, Facebook, whatever. Uh, so you'd see, you know, hundreds of people just sitting in a park or on a street corner, just you know, on Wi-Fi. This is what the cobblestone streets of Old Havana look like. If you head into Havana, it's certainly on our first day there, first morning. Uh, we like to take a stroll through Old Havana, do a walking tour. This is the Malecon, 24-7 uh, party. Uh, you know, every night is a Saturday night in Cuba. Uh, so this is the Malecon. This is a hot spot for partying, and uh, drinking, dancing. Um, there's no open container laws in Cuba, so you can head down, um, just you know, find a spot in a Malecon and hang out with your friends, have a good time. Uh, this is Vinales. Uh, you see those limestone formations in the background. Those are called magotes. Um, they arose from the sea some 200 million years ago. And um, this, is, this is where the famous uh, tobacco is grown for the Cuban cigars. Uh, it's about a three-hour trip out from Havana. It's a nice drive out into the countryside. So you can see what Cuba looks like outside of the capital city. Uh, Havana has about 2.2 million people. Cuba has about 11 and a half million. So most of Cuba is outside of Havana. So it's important to, to take in the surrounding uh, areas as well. Uh, this is what traffic looks like. This is right near the Capitol building in Havana. You see all the 1950s cars. Um, and if you notice all of them in the window say taxi. So if you have a car, you're a taxi driver. Most Cubans who are not taxi drivers don't have private cars. Some do but it's not a normal thing for Cubans to have driver's licenses and cars like it is for Americans. Um, you also see in the background uh, some old Soviet cars, Moscovich, Lada. So you, um, the taxi there on the left is an old Soviet car. Um, and you see uh, the buses on the top right, those are Chinese buses. So you can see who has influence in Cuba by uh, in what decade, by what cars are driving around. 1950s was American influence, 1980s was Soviet influence, and modern day you see Russian and Chinese influence. A uh, picture of the famous Hotel Nacional, as uh, you remember from The Godfather, a really cool place to um, just hang out at back, smoke a cigar, have a drink, overlook the water, definitely recommend it. This is what a Cuban grocery store looks like. This is a picture I took myself. Um, it's very hard to put a meal together when you go to a grocery store and this is what the aisles look like. Um, you know, it's very hard uh, because they they put out what they get in. So they got they got a shipment of ketchup, so they get you get a, you get ketchup on the shelves. Same thing. And this is up and down the aisles in Cuban grocery stores. I was at this store about a month ago, this very store. Uh, about two months ago at this point. Uh, and they had three and a half aisles of Hellman's mayonnaise. I don't know what country they imported the Hellman's mayonnaise from, but they had three and a half aisles of it. Uh, and then two more pallets in the back because that's just what came in. So that's what they put out. Uh, so it's hard to stack to, you know, to stack up food like you would at Costco or something and really put meals together when this is the situation that you're facing. Uh, this is a picture of the Malecon at night. Um, that far building, the last building all the way on the right, uh, that is the U.S. Embassy. Um, and then uh, you'll see uh, what a sunset looks like. Uh, this is from the balcony of a, a restaurant, um, one of my favorite restaurants to go to on the Malecon. Uh, it's just a really cool place to hang out, really beautiful. This is a sign that talks about, um, I am in favor of the Cuban design, a very original family. Um, so this was involving the debate on whether or not Cuba should legalize gay marriage. Um, so this was a really interesting time in Cuban history. This was a year or two ago. Uh, and this was fascinating because not only are there not often vigorous public debates in Cuba, like there are in the United States over certain issues, um, you had two uh, previously uh, severely repressed groups in the evangelical community and the gay community engaging in this intense public debate. Uh, so you had the Cuban government uh, 
in a position to manage not only a public debate, but a public debate between two previously repressed groups. Um, so gay marriage ended up getting voted down in Cuba. Um, it was originally put in as part of their new constitution. The new constitution was approved, um, but it wasn't approved until the, the part about gay marriage was removed um, after out, uh, outcries from the Cuban population, which rejected it. Uh, the Cuban government has actually been very progressive on this issue, more so than the Cuban population has. And the Cuban government would like to see gay marriage implemented as part of the family code sometime next year. Uh, this is a picture uh, from a small business called Nostalgia Car. And what they do is they restore some of the old 1950s cars. So here's an example of one of the cars that they restored. Really cool place to go visit. Uh, it's a great example of um, Cuban entrepreneurship uh, and what a what a small business is like uh, in a communist country. Uh, so this is just an advertisement for Cuban baseball. You'll see this everywhere. Um, this is right above the Havana Tour office. Havana Tour is Cuba's tourism agency in um, state-run tourism agency. Tourism is a monopoly of the state, so officially there are no private tour guides, although I'm sure you can find a few if you head down to uh, Havana. Um, but tourism being a monopoly of the state, that's their, one of their main offices on 23 and M. Uh, it's the, the street corner. Uh, and so this is advertisement for, uh, for Cuban baseball. This is a statue of John Lennon. Uh, this was inaugurated around the year 2000. Fidel Castro uh, came and attended the ceremony. This is um, called, a place called John Lennon Park. Just across the street from here is a restaurant, uh, a state-run bar and restaurant called the Yellow Submarine. It's a cool place to hang out. Uh, if you're ever in town. Um, but originally, the Beatles music was considered to be this capitalist venture that was music made for the sake of making music. Uh, but eventually, so it was banned. But uh, eventually, the Cuban government came around on that and recognized John Lennon as a revolutionary icon. Those glasses on the statue are actually removable. Uh, so when you come over to take a picture, there'll be a security guard that comes over, puts the statues on uh, the glasses on the statue for you. This is a picture where Fidel Castro was imprisoned uh, after his attack on Moncada. This is a prison um, uh, called La, at La Demahagua in um, Isla de la Juventud, Presidio Modelo. Um, it's now it's a, completely abandoned. Uh, you, you can just walk the grounds um, completely unattended if you like, as I did when I went and visited. Um, that building straight uh, up on the right, that's the administration building. Uh, what was the administration building for the jail? It's now a school, um, but it's really just a, a living museum. It's a cool place to go visit. This is Cuba's national drink. This is a, called the Cuba Libre. And the story behind that is from what we call the Spanish-American War, which is the third war of Cuban independence. The American soldiers came over with Coca-Cola. The Cubans provided rum and, and the, the native limes. And there you go, Cuba Libre, a free Cuba. Uh, it was a rum and coke. It's what, it's what it's called in every other country. This is a picture uh, of Las Terrazas Bar. This is in a town called Cojimar. And you'll see the pictures of Ernest Hemingway on the wall. Um, there's two in the back straight ahead of you and just on your left, picture of Hemingway. Um, Cojimar was where Hemingway's fishing village was. It was the, the basis for the old man on the sea. And this was the, the real bar that he would go and hang out at. Um, in Havana, you'll, you'll hear about a Floridita and a Borguita de Medio, which he did go there. Um, but this is really where he hung out. This is called Las Terrazas. It's a cool place to go visit. You'll even see his table still reserved for him in the corner. Um, uh, which is, it's a really tranquil, it's a cool place to hang out. It's about a half hour east the main city of Havana. There's a bust of Hemingway in the center of town. It's actually where Camila Cabello is from, if you know the song Havana, a uh, recent hit. So if you're in if you're in Havana, I'd recommend taking a day trip. Um, it's really a morning trip out to, uh, out to Kohimar. This is a picture of Rafael Trejo Boxing Gym. Uh, Floyd Mayweather donated a lot of money, supposedly donated a million dollars to help get it fixed up. Uh, but it's a cool place to go and watch uh, boxers train and spar. You can go meet the head trainer. His name is Nardo Maestre. Tell him I sent you. Uh, he's a cool guy. He has this magazine from the 80s that he was in that he likes to take out and show people. Um, but it's just a, it's a cool place to, to um, get some action from uh, the Cuban boxers. This is a sign for the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution, a CDR. 
And what the CDR is, it's a cross between a civic association and an internal spy agency. They just keep an eye on what's going on in the neighborhood. So if you have a shady American living next door, or if your garbage isn't being collected, or if you need to vote in the election, Cuba does have elections, as at least on the municipal level, they have elections. Um, you would do that at the CDR. There's one on every single block in Cuba, so that's how they keep an eye on things that are uh, happening in the neighborhood. This is a photo from a place called Las Terrazas, really beautiful place. Uh, Las Terrazas is also, it's a town about 45 minutes west of Havana. It's an eco community that was established by Osmani Cienfuegos, who's the brother of Camilo Cienfuegos, who is one of the right-hand men of um, Castro. Uh, this was established in the 60s, um, and there's a whole set of rules, environmental rules, that you have to um, abide by to be willing to stay there, to be um, able to, allowed to live there. Um, this is another view from Las Terrazas. If you look all the way out, uh, you'll be looking at the Port of Mariel from the famous Mariel boat lift in the 1980s. It's a really beautiful place. This is more from Las Terrazas uh, balcony from, they have a hotel called Hotel La Moca, which is a, a tree growing in the lobby. It's really a green hotel. Um, some of the views from there. Uh, what you won't see in Cuba, you won't see homeless people. Uh, we have about a half a million homeless people in the United States. Uh, just check in on everybody here. All right. Um, any questions, again, just shout it right out. Uh, so I appreciate everybody, uh, everybody sticking with us. So what you won't see in, uh, in Cuba, um, you won't see homeless people. Uh, Cuba guarantees everybody a roof over their head. Um, it might not be the most glorious living conditions, but you won't be on the streets. You'll occasionally see somebody who's mentally ill, who's refused housing, staying on the street, but that's very rare. It does happen, but it's rare. Um, you won't see shootings. Um, Cuba, um, Cuba doesn't allow for the private ownership of guns, except for in extremely limited circumstances. For example, a farmer who wants to protect his livestock or something like that. Um, but very, very limited. Um, but ironically, a higher percentage of uh, the Cuban population is trained on how to use weapons than the American population is as a mandatory military service. And um, it's mandatory for every man. Uh, it's optional for women, but many women do join. And they uh, are trained to use weapons, but they're not allowed to own them privately. Um, you won't see drug overdoses. Cuba is extraordinarily harsh on drugs. Um, we talk about um, the war on drugs being a failure in the United States. Um, this certainly isn't the forum for that debate, uh, but in Cuba, it's been extraordinarily successful. And part of the reason is not just their extremely anti-drug stance, but their surveillance system. We talked about the CDRs a moment ago. Their internal surveillance system keeps an eye on anyone who might consider getting into the, uh, into the area of drugs and they're stopped right away. So you don't see drug overdoses, you don't see heroin overdoses, you don't see cocaine sales on the streets of Havana. Um, you don't see drug cartels like you do in Mexico. Uh, it just doesn't exist. It's completely non-existent. And part of the reason why they've been able to be successful in deterring the drug trade in Cuba, this is actually where an area where the United States and Cuba have a strong partnership is combating drug trade in the Caribbean, is because Cuba is an island and they're very, um, able to, they're more able to control what comes in and out better than we are. You won't see gang violence. There's there's an inability to organize outside of the, the Cuban government, something I mentioned before. Um, so there's a really only, there's three rules that they heavily enforce in Cuba, which is don't be inappropriate with children, don't uh, do drugs, and don't organize against the state. Uh, and so there is no independent organization uh, of people. There's no freedom of assembly. So this really goes a long way in tamping down on the gang violence. There isn't gang violence in Cuba. There isn't illiteracy, something you might have, might have uh, seen during the recent Democratic debates with Bernie Sanders and his mentioning of the Cuban literacy programs run by Fidel Castro in 1961. Um, this was called an alphabetization of Cuba. It's a Spanish word. Uh, and they increase the literacy rate from somewhere between 60 and 80 percent to about 98 or 99 percent. And they sent uh, thousands of 
teachers out into the countryside to teach people how to read. Controversy about this program was that they used, um, they were accused of using communist propaganda, like C is for Che and F is for Fidel and things like that to teach people how to read. So it's left to history to judge about how, how good this program was as far as the propaganda surrounding it. Um, uh, you won't see starvation. You know, we see these pictures that come out of the civil war in Yemen, uh, where these little children are looking like skeletons. You won't see people looking like that in Cuba. Certainly, there is food shortages, especially right now in Cuba, and I don't want to downplay that. Um, there's a charity called Caritas, C-A-R-I-T-A-S, Caritas, Cuba, and they are helping Cuban people get the supplies that they need to weather this pandemic. So uh, definitely check them out if you're looking to see how you can help the Cuban people without traveling there at this time. Caritas is a way to go. They're helping Cuban people get what they need. Um, so certainly our food shortages there now. I have friends, you know, talk to them and they say, oh, you know, I have rice and beans and sardines in the house. And uh, it's better than nothing. It's not, not great, but it's better than nothing. It's, it's a tough time for them right now. Um, you won't see personal debt. There's no, there's no um, ability to access credit. There's no mortgages. There's no credit card debt. There's no lines of credit. There's no student debt. School's free. There's no medical debt. Healthcare is free. Uh, so you don't see people in personal debt in Cuba. So when I, when I'm with my groups and I'm with my Cuban tour guides, and I say, look, every single Cuban that you've met on this trip so far. On paper, they have more money than I do because I have tens of thousands of dollars in student debt and Cubans don't have that. They might not have a lot in their bank account if they have a bank account, um, but they don't have the debt that Americans do, particularly young Americans. Uh, and Starbucks, there's no American businesses in Cuba. There's a Sheraton, which got a special exception to make a deal with Gaviota under the Obama administration, but that's it. There's no McDonald's, there's no Starbucks, there's no Walmart. There's no American infrastructure like that. Um, there's no, so the Sheraton, when you see it is very strange to see, cause it's the only American thing around. Um, an exception to that would be Google has some, um, they're helping out with Cuba's internet infrastructure. Verizon has service there, but there's no Verizon stores in Cuba. Um, so there's limited services that are offered from the American side, but there's no physical sightings of American businesses in Cuba with the exception of the Sheraton. Um, so some myths I want to uh, cover about Cuba. Uh, one is that Cuban food is spicy. It's not. Cuban food is actually pretty mild. They will offer you hot sauce because they know Americans like spicy food, but um, you won't see, you won't, Cuban food is not spicy. It's not like Mexican or some, some other Latin dish. Um, that before the pandemic, it was tra difficult to travel to Cuba as an American. This wasn't true. Um, there were cruises for a short amount of time before those were, uh, canceled on a day's notice. Um, but you could just go to JFK and hop on a flight and you just certify support for the Cuban people. You have an itinerary and there you go. And that's what I did. I helped people develop those itineraries. Um, the Cuban people felt oppressed by the government and were longing for a capitalist democracy. You really don't see that. Uh, the, you know, the Cuban memory of democracy it was from the first 60 years of the 20th century, very turbulent time. Their government was overthrown three or four times, depending if you count 1933 once or twice. Um, they remember the turbulence and the violence around the elections. Uh, and when they think of capitalism, you know, it's been drained, drilled into their head for 60 years about how bad capitalism is. So that, that is, they're hesitant on that part. And when they think about capitalism, they think about a transition away from their socialist institutions that they're proud of, like their healthcare system and their education system. They think a transition to capitalism would mean taking those things away and putting those things in their private hands. So when we talk about expanding the private sector in Cuba, which certainly they've done, the Cuban, the Cuban private sector is now 20 to 30 percent of the economy. Um, they, they call themselves socialist entrepreneurs rather than capitalists because they view their entrepreneurship as a way of supporting the state system. The tax dollars that they pay go to support the state rather than transitioning those state institutions into private hands. So that's a significant difference. Um, are the present day Cuban refugees are largely political refugees. This hasn't been true for 30 years. If you left Cuba in the 60s, 70s or 80s, you were likely a political refugee getting away from the Castro government. 
Um, but since the fall of the Soviet Union, the Cubans have been coming to the United States for the same reason that people from Guatemala or South America or Asia or Africa or anywhere else come to the United States. And that's for a better opportunity uh, in their economic lives. They want an economic opportunity. They, they want an, an ability to start a business and see it thrive and um, not be so dependent on tourists like Cuba is. Um, so really, it's been economic refugees um, for about the last 30 years. They're not political refugees, but the the people who made it over to Florida, who have the political sway, who have the money, to have influence in politics in the United States, those are your political refugees from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, more so than the economic refugees of the of the recent years. So that's why people like Marco Rubio, he's representing the older, wealthier Miami Cuban population rather than the younger Cuban population, which wants to strengthen ties with Cuba for the sake of economics. Uh, rather than hold a grudge against Cuba for their uh, political um, values. Um, uh, Cuba is a Caribbean Soviet Union or North Korea. This really couldn't be further from the truth. If you read uh, Solzhenitsyn and the Soviet Union and what happened in, under the Stalin years, or if you read, uh, you know, you look at what's going on in North Korea, um, with the craziness that happens over there, and then you, got, you go to Cuba, you, it's night and day. Cuba is wide open compared to these places. You see freedom of movement. You see freedom of speech. Um, Cubans aren't allowed to, um, they can't have, they don't have freedom of assembly. They can't go hold a sign that says, you know, down with Raul. Um, but the Cubans, Cubans like to joke that their national sport is not baseball and it's complaining. Because Cubans have, they'll tell you that they have the ability to talk about whatever they want and to say whatever they want, to complain, but when they try to do something about it, that, that, that they might get in trouble. Um, so it's a weird freedom of speech, but that's certainly much looser than you would see in some place like the Soviet Union or North Korea. Um, uh, the traveling there was only supporting a tyrannical government. For, for Americans, this definitely was not the case because we were traveling there to support the Cuban people and, and support the private sector. That was our entire purpose of being there. So the vast majority of your schedule was going to be centered around supporting the Cuban private sector and putting money directly into the Cuban people's hands, not the government's, um, and really engaging with the Cuban people and, and showing them, you know, tips and trip tips and tricks about how you run your business and how they can run their business. If you remember Marcus Limonis is on uh, CNBC, the prophet. He went down to Cuba. He did a whole episode about small businesses there. Um, so that's the kind of traveling we were doing. We weren't going down there and, and you know just sitting at uh, you know, state-run resorts. Um, it, the American travel was uniquely important for the Cuban private sector. And the fact that that's all disappeared now has been devastating for the Cuban small business owners. Um, and you know, Cuba is a partisan issue. This is a really important one that Republicans are anti-Cuba and Democrats are pro-Cuba. That's not true across the board. You have Republicans such as Jeff Flake and Mike Enzi, um, who are two senators, uh, Rand Paul from Kentucky, James Comer from Kentucky, um, Greg Abbott from Texas, uh, Republicans in Indiana and Alabama and Virginia. They're all supportive of lifting the Cuban embargo and they're supportive of moving, um, increasing trade with Cuba because they want to, um, that it'll be good for their agricultural sectors in, the, in those countries. Um, so it's, it's important that these, um, that to recognize that 95% of, of exports from the United States to Cuba is we have one way trade for cash only. We can't uh, offer credit to Cuba, which is another issue that, um, puts us at a competitive disadvantage, but 95% of agriculture exports from the United States to Cuba are from Republican states. Uh, so there's a really big push in agricultural Republican states to increase trade with Cuba. Um, then you, on the other hand, you have um, Democrats such as Bob Menendez in New Jersey and Debbie Wasserman Schultz in Florida, or we'll remember her from the 2016 election. Um, these are Democrats who are anti-Cuba because they represent Cuban, they either are Cuban American in Menendez's case, or represent Cuban American cons constituents who don't want to see a normalization in relations with Cuba. So um, you have some Democrats like President Obama, who was pro-Cuba, and you have uh, some Democrats like Menendez and Wasserman Schultz who are against it. 
And on the Republican side, you have the Marco Rubios and um, Donald Trump. I don't think he really cares personally. Uh, he tried to do business as a private businessman with Cuba, but then when he became president, it became um, to his political uh, advantage to hand the Cuba to Rubio. Uh, so you have the Marco Rubios of the world uh, who are anti-Cuba, but then you have Rand Paul and the others I named uh, who are pro-Cuba. Uh, this was more relevant maybe a month ago, a month or two ago, but uh, differences between the Bernie Sanders type of socialism in Cuba um, and, and what the Cubans have. So uh, really big differences. I would get really frustrated when I would, I would watch these debates and I would hear these ridiculous questions comparing, um, you know, some of these democratic platforms to the Cuban platform. And it's just, it's just so different, night and day. And Cuba, you... Um, have public ownership of all the means of production. So all of the major industries are government owned and operated. And the private sector is small and it was there only to support the, the socialist institutions. So like, there's no Amazon in Cuba because the Amazon in Cuba would be owned and operated by the government. Um, where in like Bernie Sanders world, Amazon stays in private hands and you have a regulated and a highly taxed capitalist free market system so you have a capitalist system, which is regulated and highly taxed versus Cuba, where you have a socialist system where the government owns the means of production, owns all of the major industries and the small private sector to support it. These are significantly different types of economies uh, and they were lumped into being one and the same. And it was very frustrating to see, you know, Denmark style capitalism versus Cuban socialism are two entirely different systems um, and healthcare. You know, government run, like the Cuban government owns and operates the Cuban medical system, period. There's no private sector medical care in Cuba, where in, in Medicare for all, the means of production stay in private hands, but the government pays the bill. Very different. You have the criminalization versus the legalization of drugs. Cuba is very harsh on drugs, where um, the democratic platforms are typically aimed at legalizing drugs in the U.S., um, you have a single party authoritarian state versus a multi-party democracy. You have a Cuban economy that's under extremely heavy sanctions, the heaviest sanctions any country has ever levied against another in the history of the world for the past 60 years. Uh, and the United States simply isn't under those same conditions. So to compare the results of Cuba and what Cuba looks like visually to the United States or what the United States would look like under one of these um, administrations. It's just, it's not fair uh, because they're not the same. You know, people were leaving Cuba for the same reason that they would leave uh, any developing country, which is for economic reasons, at least for the last 30 years, which is a significant amount of time. Um, you have state media versus the free press in this country. Um, the ability to have freedom of assembly or the second amendment in this country, and you don't have that in Cuba. So the idea that these were these platforms are somehow similar, uh, it just was, was complete nonsense. Um, so if there's any other questions, uh, a few final takeaways. Uh, Cuba, again, is, was the safest country, is the safest country in the hemisphere and they love Americans. Um, please keep an eye on Cuba. It's very mindful to keep an eye on what's going on there, particularly with the election coming up. Uh, Florida is a swing state, um, so Cuba policy is going to come into play. Um, and I've been expecting sanctions to be levied against Cuba as we get cl closer to the election. With the pandemic going on, I'm not sure how that's going to affect things. The uh, Trump administration did levy sanctions on Iran, um, but they haven't levied sanctions as I expected against Cuba, but those, those may be in the pipeline. Um, again, we have, we have opposite systems, opposite problems, as I tried to lay out with the differences and things that Cuba has that we don't have and vice versa. Um, but we as Americans have the power to determine our relationship going forward with Cuba. So pay attention to your senators, your congressmen, um, and the stances they take on Cuba. And with any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, uh, chris at cubafame.com. Uh, so with that, I'll say thank you very much to, um, to Peter and everybody at Sable Library, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you again, everybody.